Have you seen a Kurdish awakening in Iran? Last week, thousands of Iranian Kurds rioted in their capital city, Mahabad, where they set a hotel on fire in protest against the unexplained death of this woman on the screen, Farinaz Khosravi, a Kurdish chambermaid. Kurds say the 25-year-old woman chose to commit suicide to escape an alleged rape attempt, an alleged rape attempt, sorry, by an Iranian government official. What happened to that woman and is it possible for a Kurdish spring to take place? Here in our Washington studios, I'm joined by Matthew McKins, a Middle East expert serving as a non-resident fellow uh, with, the, with the American Enterprise Institute, AEI, and John Hanna, a senior expert at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. Uh, John has written extensively on the Kurds. Thank you very much to both of you for joining us. John, uh, you've visited Iraqi Kurdistan region, but I'm not sure if you've visited Iranian Kurdistan. Uh, but what we saw last week, uh, the death of that woman and the uh, riots that ensued, and of course then there was uh, a crackdown, a brutal crackdown on the protesters that uh, immediately uh, brought a halt to the riots. Not immediately, but after a couple of days. What does it tell about the Kurdish cause the Kurdish issue in, in Iran? Well, I think mostly it, it suggests that the Kurdish movement in Iran uh, is still alive and well, that Kurds still feel that their rights, political rights, uh, religious rights of a lot of Sunni uh, Kurds, uh, their ethnic rights are not recognized. By the, uh, the, by the Islamic Republic, and in fact, they're quite harshly repressed. And it took a single kind of incident like this to have it rise up again and for Kurds to say, we're here, we object to this regime, we need our rights recognized. So I think it's an important reminder that there remains a, uh, a vibrant and real Kurdish nationalist movement inside of Iran itself that we need to hopefully pay more attention to. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew, do you believe this uh, nationalist movement, as he describes, in Iran uh, would see the kind of um, revival we've seen in Iranian, Kurd in Iraqi Kurdistan, or in Turkish even, uh, Kurdish region, where you have, uh, where the Kurdish parties are so active and they win elections in their own cities. Are we going to see any kind of um, awakening in Iranian Kurdistan? Well, I, I certainly think, as John indicated, that the, the movement to, you know, for greater autonomy or greater you know, expression of political rights is certainly alive and well inside uh, Iranian Kurdish, re the Iranian Kurdish region. But you know, the, the government in Tehran is approaching and approach this issue very differently than what we've seen from Ankara mm -hmm. in, in the Turkish regions or from Baghdad in, uh, in the Iraqi uh, regions. The, the Iranians are, are extremely concerned about what may be happening in the Kurdish areas from uh, external influence, from you know sabotage, from you know, espionage, and other types of activities uh, that they always fear are happening inside their borders. Uh, so they're you know as the regime is heading into this uncharted territory after a potential nuclear deal, uh, it's going to be very very concerned about what's happening uh, inside its population, even more so than it is now. Uh, and so I would see the regime is is going to push back as much as they can. Uh, against uh, what was happening right now inside uh, the Kurdish region. Mm -hmm. So, uh, ca can we say, John, that uh, even uh, when or if uh, Iran and uh, the United States mend ties with, which, with each other and there is a normalization of ties between the two countries, which is quite probably a far away possibility even at the moment, uh, Iran will still remain brutal to its own population, including the Kurdish people? I, I think there's almost no question. I mean, even while these nu nuclear negotiations have been going on, we've seen that the Iranian crackdown on, uh, on the public at large and the Kurds specifically has been as brutal as it's ever been under Rouhani. More executions, more people in prison, more arrests. Um, and I think they've done it with the knowledge that there's very little the West or the United States will do 
or even to talk about this issue of repression inside of Iran because people are so eager to try and complete this nuclear deal. Why is the United States not speaking out against it? Well, I think, of, I think it's quite obvious. The United States is not speaking out about human rights in Iran. The United States is not speaking out about the awful repression, Iranian-sponsored repression inside Syria. The United States hasn't done very much about the uh, the Iranian-backed insurgency inside of Yemen that even brought down but a why? government. Because I think they're so interested in this nuclear deal in the first place in the White House. They're interested in completing this nuclear deal. They don't want to anger the Iranian government. They don't want the Iranian government to uh, to do anything to disrupt these nuclear negotiations. And then I think, frankly, it's my view that the president does have a much larger agenda vis-a-vis -vis the Iranian government, vis-a-vis -vis the Islamic, Islamic Republic, which is some kind of rapprochement and even detente mm. between the United States and Iran, and raising these difficult issue of human rights and the brutality of the Islamic Republic is just not convenient for the United States at this time. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with him that the United States or the Obama administration has been less vocal than his predecessors, than, uh, say, George W. Bush or the previous presidents about Iran's uh, human rights abuses? No, I, I think that John is absolutely right about this. The, 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 the U.S. is very concerned that uh, a deal go through uh, this year uh, and that, and there's a belief in the White House that, you know, or at least aspiration, that once you have a deal, other issues can be dealt with more uh, more appropriately, uh, so that they're for for them. They if you press them, uh, they'll acknowledge. Yeah, we're we're not uh, addressing these issues the way we would like, uh, but at the same time, hey, let's get through the deal and we'll be in a position to do so. I have a lot of you know concerns that that's not going to play out that way, uh, and and I think actually as as Iran engages more uh, in, in the in the international economy with the West after a nuclear deal. The, the regime is going to be even more concerned about these external influences coming in, uh, and uh, frankly, we're going to see an, an intense uh, crackdown on you know social media, on internal dissent, uh, and on issues like uh, the Kurds or, or the Baluchis in, in, in southeastern Iran. That it's going to be very difficult for the Iranian people because the regime is nervous about where are we taking all this after we have some type of rapprochement, if that actually happens, uh, with the West. Mm -hmm. But that's definitely not what the Iranian people hope for. Like most of the Iranian people celebrated the, the interim deal that was reached between the P5 plus 1 countries and Iran because they hope that there will be less repression. Uh, women will be freer in Iran. People in general can be freer in Iran. So <clears throat> you don't see that as a byproduct of this? Well, deal? I think the, the, the main, with the social contract that's happened between uh, the people, if you could call it that, between President Rouhani when he was elected and the, and, and the Iranian population, is that I'm, I'm going to make your lives better. And I think that there is a, uh, the, the, the main thing here is economics. And it's, it's there, the, the, need, the sanctions were having a, a really <coughs> terrible effect on the middle class in particular. Uh, and I think that's what Rouhani is promising. He wasn't promising a new, necessarily a new open society, a new, uh, you know, new relationship, you know. But he was saying, hey, I'm going to de-escalate things with the West, which is actually what he is doing. He is trying to tone it down uh, with, with the U.S. and with the West. And I think the Iranian people do want that. Um, at, at the same time, the big thing is, is money and it's economic security, uh, which I think that that's what Rouhani believes he has to deliver on. I think their supreme leader recognizes they have to deliver on that issue. The other issues, they don't necessarily feel they have to deliver. Mm -hmm. So when, when we talk about the, the Kurdish question in the Middle East, uh, now many countries in the Middle East, including Turkey, Iraq, and even the United States, remain opposed to an independent Kurdish state, uh, even in Iraq, because they believe that could, uh, you know, destabilize the region by other Kurds, such as Iranian Kurds, for example, or Turkish Kurds, ask for independence. But do you believe the Iranian Kurds have already gotten any inspiration from their brethren in Syria and in Iraq? Uh, because of the degree of autonomy they've gained uh, in those two countries over the past decade? 
I think almost inevitably when they see the kinds of progress that's been made particularly in Iraq and now increasingly perhaps inside of Syria where Kurds, uh, even though it's difficult, are beginning to run their own lives to a certain extent. I think inevitably this has an impact on Kurd, the Kurdish diaspora everywhere in the world, that they look in the, at this, and in particularly in places like Iran, like Turkey, other places, that they believe that this is something's happening in the Kurdish national movement, and it does create a certain hope, aspiration, and maybe even expectation on their, on their part. And this, of course, is what why the Iranian government, the Turkish government, the Syrian government, the Iraqi government have always been afraid of this issue of political autonomy and the threat that it might pose to the integrity of these dictatorial regimes. If they begin to give the Kurds anywhere a little bit of their rights, then Kurds everywhere in the region will suddenly be demanding that they need the same kinds of rights. What, why hasn't uh, why haven't the Iranian Kurds achieved anything close to what the Iraqi Kurds have achieved, for example. I mean, I Iran wasn't as brutal as Saddam Hussein. Hasn't been as brutal. Well, I'd say, I'd say two things. First of all, of course, the, the Iraqi Kurds only began uh, achieving something when they actually had uh, an American protection and an American air cover for 20 years, uh, more than 20 years. They've had this Starting kind of, 1991 this kind of protection no and relationship with the United States. A few years before that, they were a target of real genocide, genuine genocide by the regime of Saddam Hussein. So quite a bit changed when you can have that kind of relationship and protection from the United States. And to their credit, the Iraqi Kurds, I think, have tried to take advantage of that to a great degree. Whether or not uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran is as brutal as, as Saddam Hussein, it's a, it's a difficult choice. They're mm. both incredibly brutal regimes, and I think between the Basij and the Revolutionary Guard and the Iranian intelligence services and the internal security forces, this is a very brutal regime. There are an awful lot so, of Kurds so who have suffered since 1979. So you're saying basically the reason for why the Kurds in Iran haven't achieved anything because they haven't had Western backing yet? They certainly don't have Western backing. They face an incredibly brutal regime that's willing to kill a lot of people. And let's be frank, uh, the Kurdish movement in a lot of different places for decades and decades has its own internal problems. Absolutely. There are I'd lots like of divisions amongst of the, Kurds in, everywhere. And there, if, if Kurds were able to unite, we would probably have a much different situation, as you know, for the Absolutely. Kurdish national movement. Absolutely, John. But we need to take a short break now. After a short break, we'll be back to dig deeper on the Iranian Kurdish question and talk uh, explicitly about, uh, sorry, talk specifically about the internal divisions within the Kurdish parties there and how they have played a, a negative role in the, uh, the uh, progression of the Kurdish cause in that country. Please do stay with us. Hello again and welcome back to Inside America. Today we are discussing the cause of the Kurdish people in the Islamic Republic of Iran. As we, uh, as we have all seen, some rioting has uh, taken place in that, in that country over the unexplained death of a Kurdish woman who had worked in a hotel. Now there are uh, uh, questions whether this uh, death could result in more political uh, uprisings in that country. Um, John, you earlier talked about uh, something which is very familiar to all the Kurds, very interesting, and we all agree that it played a significant role in the fact that we remain probably the largest group in the world without an independent state of our own, internal disunity. The Kurds have always been disunited. Uh, why don't you talk about that specifically in Iran? Was it the case more so in Iran than in Iraq or Turkey or Syria? I'm not sure it was uh, more. I think it's been, it's been bad in a lot of places, but it clearly has been a serious problem in, in Iran. Particularly, I think, uh, we see, obviously, in the rise of uh, what we call here in the United States, PJAC, 
uh, the Kurdish the Party uh, for Free Life of Kurdistan political movement and military wing that have uh, believed to have very strong affiliations so with the PKK good. out of Turkey. Um, so I think those kinds of ties have, uh, they've displaced a number of more traditional uh, Kurdish uh, Iranian political parties. There's been competition between them, some resentment of the Turkish influence. I'm told if you go into a lot of uh, houses in Iranian Kurdistan, uh, pictures of Abdullah Öcalan from the uh, uh, Turkish uh, PKK movement are quite, quite prevalent. So uh, I think all of these things create, uh, create problems and rivalries and competitions between Kurds that prevent the kind of unity you would want to see when you're facing such a vicious and difficult enemy as the, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran and trying to gain your rights. You really do need a degree of unity and you need support obviously from the Kurdish diaspora as well and we know between Iraq and Iran and Turkey and Syria, the, the various Kurdish parties all are engaged in a kind of rivalry and competition with each other that makes that kind of united stance often very difficult. Very interesting. Matthew, uh, he talks about disunity among the Kurdish people. Iraqi Kurds were probably equally uh, disunited. Mm -hmm. We had a civil war in, in the mid-1990s among two main major Iraqi Kurdish parties. But then at some point, the United States stepped in. I still remember when Madeleine Albright was the Secretary of State, she was personally the one who was mediating between the leaders of the two Kurdish parties. And uh, they were invited in Washington. And then that uh, conflict was over by 1988. So. And then, of course, at, the, at that time, the United States was building a strong opposition against Saddam Hussein. Mm -hmm. It needs the Kurds. So can we say there hasn't been as much need uh, for, the Iraq Syrian for the Iranian Kurds from the United States? Well, certainly, if, if the U.S. policy was to build a strong opposition, to the Iranian regime, I think you would perhaps see some type of role there. But again, that was an environment that uh, Secretary Albright was engaging in, as, as John described, where it was under you know U.S. protection, uh, you know, no from, from no fly zone, which is n certainly not something that we would have or I can envision happening uh, inside Iran, inside Iran's borders. But I do think that if, if the U.S. was pursuing that type of policy, the, the U.S. could theoretically play some type of role. But I think it'd be very difficult uh, to have that kind of same play that you had in the 1990s in Iraq. Um, and, and also remember, when it comes to divisions, you know, the Iranians also are very adept at playing up those divisions. And it's one of the things that um, certainly benefits of how they manage their internal um, ethnic uh, issues uh, and internal stability is being able to kind of poke and prod and, and accelerate some of those uh, divisions. Uh, so it's one of the other challenges that the Kurds there face. Mm -hmm. So see, uh, with, with the uh, nuclear talks going on, uh, and the uh, regime change no longer a United States goal in Iran. Uh, there's almost no hope that the Kurds will see more political freedoms and, uh, in Iran. Well, I would never say there's no hope. Uh, I just think it's a very dim hope right now, okay. uh, given the direction that the U.S. wants to take with Iran, or at least under this administration. A lot can change in 2017 uh, with a new president here. Uh, from either party, frankly, uh, so that that but what Iran wants to achieve right now, and the kind of in, at least in the next two years, uh, with getting the U.S. to kind of shift its alliances slightly away from its traditional partners in Saudi Arabia, the other Gulf Arab states, and Israel, uh, towards a little bit more balanced position uh, between Iran and, and those players. That that direction is something that I, I know the Iranians want to capitalize on as much as possible before President Obama leaves. Uh, so I think that this is a, and how this is going to progress, I don't know long term. Uh, but the, the Iranians are going to be looking at a, a U.S. that they feel is probably going to be decreasing its role uh, in the region. Uh, and certainly when it comes to support for groups, whether it's, you know, 
dissidents within the Iranian uh, society writ large. And at the same time last week, there's been huge te teacher strikes all across Iran, uh, almost at the same time as the Kurdish riots. Uh, not necessarily related, but it's, you know, the, that Iran is still dealing with a lot of unhappiness uh, among its people about how the regime is operating. Uh, but I think the Iran is looking forward to a time when the U.S. is less engaged in this issue uh, and that, that Iran feels like it can manage its own house uh, with less interference from their perspective. Mm. So he talked about, the, uh, they talked about the uh, economic uh, benefits of this this nuclear deal between the United States and Iran for the Iranian population. Uh, of course, once the sanctions are eased or lifted entirely, uh, a lot more money will flow into Iran and the economy will um, revive. But, uh, so you don't necessarily see um, that economic revival result in more uh, political awakening in Iran. So. Now, I mean, would, would the people remain satisfied with just, you know, economic well-being in their country? Uh, it's it's hard hard to say. I think, as Matt says, there's a huge amount of um, of uh, discontent inside of Iran. I think beneath the uh, beneath the surface. So, what will happen once the Iranian people begin uh, uh, having their economic life uh, improve? Sure. Um, will they have other things then that they can worry about and be concerned about? The lack of real political freedoms? Will that, can that lead to something? Um, perhaps. I do think that a, a Western or American role in trying to foster that kind of civil society and political awakening, human rights <coughs> inside of Iran, my view is that it only comes more important after a nuclear deal. Because uh, a nuclear deal may last for 10 years, it may last for 15 years, but at the end of that road, yeah. when we lift all the nuclear restrictions on Iran, if we still have in place a regime like the one we have today <coughs> that hates America, wants to destroy Israel, is sending the Quds force across the region to create instability, that kind of Iran with a dramatically increased nuclear capability, I think, will be a terrible threat to the world. So between now and 10 years or 15 years, I think we really have to be working and concentrating the rest of the world on how do we promote some kind of reform and change inside of Iran to make that regime in Tehran a less threatening regime to the world. And it seems to me that promoting human rights promoting the rights of minorities and women and, uh, and people like the Kurds inside of Iran who want a different, more normal, more democratic society, uh, it seems to me that should be rise to the top of the American foreign policy agenda rather than disappearing from our, certainly not under this administration. I think they are so desperate for this nuclear deal. And I think after a deal, if a deal is done, after it, they'll be even more desperate because then everything will depend on Iranian cooperation with the deal, and Iran will always be able to say, if you're interfering in my internal affairs, I'm going to stop cooperating so with the nuclear deal. So do you believe the United deal. States should scrap the deal? I think the deal that I understand is being negotiated right now, regardless of what it means for the Kurds, I think it's a bad deal for the United States and our most important allies, strategic allies that we rely on the Middle East. I think it's a dangerous uh, agreement, the one that I think is going to be, to be negotiated and agreed to uh, at the end of June. I think it's a bad deal from the standpoint of the American national interests in terms of what it's going to do to strengthen the Islamic Republic of Iran, which is a real enemy of the United States. So whether or not I would scrub the talks, I would conduct the talks, I think, in a much different way, probably a much tougher way, using a much bigger stick in my hand, because I do think the Iranian economy is in very bad shape. It is nearly bankrupt. And I think back in November 2013, instead of agreeing to make some kind of sanctions relief, we had actually decided to keep the very tough sanctions on and even increase them over the course of another six months, another year, I think we would have had Iran in a much different place, much more vulnerable place, and then the prospect that America could actually get some real nuclear concessions from Iran, I think, could have been a, a real possibility. 
Matthew, as, as perhaps a last question, uh, if, if, even if there's a deal between the Obama administration and, uh, say, the Rouhani administration in Iran, uh, is there any guarantee that that deal will uh, last under the next U.S. administration? There's no guarantee. I, I think that there is a likelihood that the deal uh, will, in its in some form, continue through the next presidency. But you know, given the Iran, uh, the Iran, uh, the Iranians' uh, historical record on following through on their agreements, uh, and frankly, their history of hiding things, uh, I think it's very likely we're going to encounter some type of crisis. Uh, in the early part of, or some part during the next president's administration, where we find out that Iran actually hasn't been fulfilling its part of the deal, and it's going to create a very difficult scenario uh, for the U.S. along with its allies uh, and, and within the United Nations uh, Security Council to be able to resolve it. And I think it's it's going to be it'd be very surprising if Iran held through all of its uh, agreements for ten years, and then of course, as John says, when we're at the end of those ten years. Iran's going to have almost an industrial capacity to go after, you know, uranium enrichment uh, and its and its uh, ability to do research and development and, and technological pr progress on a potential weapon. It, it, there's really no cap to what Iran can do at that point. And so this is this is a gamble. This is we are gambling that Iran is going to change its its basic policies to try to pursue a, a weapons capability that it's been it's been pursuing for the last uh, you know 10, 15 years, uh, and that that it's going to it's going to change its mind. And it's going to become a better regime, a nicer regime after 10 years, uh, and that, that, that's, that's what we're, we're betting on. And I think it's, it's a very scary bet. Uh, well, it seems definitely scary to many people. Thank you very much, Matthew, for talking to Rudow. And John, thank you very much to you also for talking to us. Pleasure. It was a really interesting and strong analysis of the subject. Dear viewers, thank you very much to you also for watching. Until next time and another program, be well.